So what I'm going to talk about today is just an overview about what I mean by screening and surveillance and assessment because I think as usual we all talk at different, same words, different meanings or same meanings, different words. Uh, why we screen um, with regard to developmental and behavioural mental health difficulties. Um, what we mean by universal screening, so that's the screening that's open to everybody um, and then why we do targeted screening particularly in TS and then talk about the TAN checklist, which is hopefully what well, you've all got a copy of it now. And again, it's another one of those things that you can take along with you to your doctors. So that's us, the tin shed down at the bottom of the road. Uh, so that's Tumberton Clinic, if anyone um, wondered. So we're just now, you probably drove past us this morning. Uh, and we provide um, sort of tier three and tier four assessment in terms of developmental difficulties. So once there's a concern has emerged. What I mean by surveillance um, comes from the American Academy guidelines um, around looking for developmental and behavioural difficulties in children. So surveillance is the process of recognising a child who may be at risk of a developmental difficulty and all health professionals who work with children should be doing this at every visit. So this is looking for a potential problem, being aware that a potential there's a potential difficulty or that this child has a higher rate of risk than other children do. Screening is an active process where you use a tool and I'll come back to why we need to use a tool um, and then ultimately evaluation which is an American word I'd say assessment um, so we that's the definitive process of looking at a child's strengths and weaknesses and do they meet a diagnostic criteria that means that we need to go down a particular path in terms of management so why why do we screen in developmental pediatrics um, our aim is to optimize outcome um, to get each individual child that we look after to reach the best potential they can reach. Um, we, the premise of this really is that if we identify things early, we can use the brain's natural plasticity. So that's the brain's ability to learn and change over time. Now that, that doesn't just happen in childhood. You see that in adults post-stroke, that relearning of skills, developing um, different skills through life. But, but we're very aware that when there are difficulties you, with the right intervention in place, you can make a difference in terms of outcomes and changing skill development. And a, a concept that I'll come to, which we call sensitive periods. So this is not exclusive to TS, this is all children. There are critical periods in our development by which we need to have developed certain skills to then have those skills going forward, or it's much harder to develop those skills if you don't catch them at that time. We like to find difficulties so we can plan and support and manage them. Um, we want to prevent secondary disability. So that is if you have a primary problem, ADHD, for example. The idea is to manage the ADHD so that you don't, then don't develop learning difficulties. So that's what I mean by secondary disability. So it's something that leads on from the original finding. Um, providing family support, um, I think, is essential. And in current funding systems, a diagnosis often brings with it specific funding and allows support both in terms of the community and in terms of schooling and education. And I think and we can't get past that. I mean, in an ideal world, people should get the funding they need based on what they need, but that isn't how it currently works. The NDIS holds some promise that we're looking at functional assessment rather than diagnostically led, but we're not there yet. So um, we screen in development because development changes, and it changes really rapidly over particularly the first five years, but all the way through childhood. And our skills we develop sequentially, and it's pretty hardwired. It doesn't really matter where you are in the world. This is how children develop. Um, and that way we, we know what to expect at the different age groups and what we're looking for at different age groups changes. So it's very different when you're doing a developmental review on a one-year-old to doing a developmental review on a five-year-old or a 12-year-old. So one-off assessments, one-off catch-ups don't, don't work. We need to be looking at children repeatedly over time um, to work out whether or not things are going as they should be and if, they, if they're not, then intervening because clearly development really you need every little step to work I mean, you can't sit until you've got neck control you can't stand until you've got trunkal control and, and that's how most of development works it's about filling in the gaps along the way um, the other reason we feel that it's important to identify things early is that currently for most of the patients i look after we can't do anything about developmental potential um, although there is i think a lot of hope that 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 will change as time goes by. But at the moment, we are each have our individual potential. Um, our job is to increase the protective factors so that you can reach that potential 
and minimise the risk factors to decrease that potential. So on a population level, we're talking about quality early childhood, we're talking about breastfeeding, we're talking about immunisation. In TS, we're talking about managing seizures, um, identifying difficulties, putting in place um, appropriate interventions as they're required. But it's really the idea of just sort of making things as good as they can be um, and optimising all those protective factors. These are these sensitive periods or critical periods of early development that I was talking about that in developmental paediatrics are really important to us. Um, probably the easiest one to describe is the, the hearing and central auditory systems. Uh, you've all seen babies, so six months old all sound the same. They all babble, ba 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 ma 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 They're internationally, it doesn't matter where you go. By nine months, their babble sounds like the, the language that they're growing up in. So it, they're not speaking Mandarin and they're not speaking English, but they kind of sound, they have the shape, and that, that comes from your laying down of your phenomes. So it's the, the taking in the environment um, and laying down the early basis for language development, which ultimately is the basis for reading. Um, and that is a really critical period, happens in the second half of the first year of life. Um, and that's why we screen for hearing at birth. Because the idea is if you have a profound hearing loss, you have your cochlear implant before six months. So that you have the opportunity to develop those, lay down those phenomes, develop language normally, and develop literacy skills normally. So that is, that's the idea of these critical periods. The other big one that's, that's in terms of um, an obvious example is the binocular vision. So having both your eyes working at the same time in both directions. Um, if you don't do that, you end up with two images. The brain ignores one of them because obviously it's quite confronting. It's like watching the fuzzy television. Um, if you don't have input into your eye, your eye does not develop. Um, and so if you don't treat a squint, um, the weaker eye or the eye that's being ignored will not develop good vision into the future. So that, that's really, that's why screening and surveillance in the general population as well as in the TS population is important because we, we know we can make a difference, we want to optimise outcomes and we don't want to miss these critical periods of development. So we have universal screening, which in New South Wales is the blue book. I'm pretty sure it's the red book in Queensland. I think it's the blue book in Victoria. Um, but they, it, these are... Um, the, in most developed countries, we have these early childhood checks. And I'm going to talk briefly about those because I think it's, they are underused in New South Wales. I can't talk about the rest of the country, but certainly in New South Wales, we're not taking it. We struggle to get the assessments done for children with TS and lots of other children, but we're not using that basic entry level, which, which often guides us into those different systems. And then I'm going to talk about the TAN checklist, which is obviously a specific screener, which is not just the first five years, but is lifelong. Um, so universal surveillance, all the states have got it, New Zealand's got it, um, they're all slightly different, but the idea really is that um, they're there to monitor child health, development and well-being and optimise it. So they do um, hearing screening at birth, we do vision screening before you start school, we do the well, well baby checks that go all the way through that most of us kind of stop doing at about 12 months. They do go all the way through up to preschool and that's really that opportunity the first time if there aren't other issues that aren't being identified in other ways that we can pick up children who need additional support. The reason we have these regular scheduled visits is it gets you get to know the child because clearly what we expect at different ages is different um, and they use this standardised evidence-based assessment tool because we're better when we use a tool than when we just ask questions um, or if we, even better if we're not asking any questions at all. So I'm just going to talk about New South Wales because they're all pretty similar and it just it provides an exemplar and I think the majority, the, the biggest group today are from New South Wales. So essentially the, that's the blue book, you should have all been given one, red book, different shades in different states and presumably New Zealand has another colour as well. Um, this contains the PEDS which is the standard screening tool. So this is asking for parents uh, what are you worried about um, and it's supposed to be done routinely through childhood. We know that asking parents specific questions about concerns is a really, really sensitive predictor of difficulties. And the problem is we don't often ask or we don't listen. And this is a standardised tool which is used internationally, it's American, but it's been translated, it's used in many parts of the world. And all it does is says, are you worried? Yes, no, and um, in the various domains. If there is a concern that comes up on the PEDS, um, in this area, this should all be done by your early childhood nurses. Um, they will then give you the ASQ, which is the Ages and Stages Questionnaire, which you fill in. I'll talk about that a little bit more. If that demonstrates an area of concern, then different areas have got different ways of, of supporting children to go forward towards a more definitive diagnostic assessment. 
for this fantastic diagram is ours. This is for South East Sydney, uh, Northern Sector. So essentially the area around Sydney Children's Hospital. I'm not going to go through it because they couldn't have made it more complicated if they tried. But essentially it's a tiered system. So you do the PEDS, you do the ASQ, then you come to my clinic to do the ADST, which is another screening tool. And if you need to, you have a definitive assessment at Tumberton. So it's that sort of pyramid type approach. I don't know who designed this, but I'm obviously having one of those days. The reason we use the tools is because we're much better with tools than without. So if you, even in the hands of an experienced clinician, if you, do, if you don't use a tool, you pick up a significantly smaller proportion of children with difficulties than you do if you use a tool. So in terms of developmental disabilities, we're saying in the, even in the hands of experienced clinicians, you pick up a, th a third as opposed to three quarters if you're using a standardized tool. And with mental health, we're even worse. So it's about a fifth compared to nearly 90%, depending on which tool you're using. So there, there, I do this every day, but I use a tool because I'm better with a tool than without. And those that don't use do this every day need a tool even more. Um, so this is the tool. That's, this is the PEDS, um, which hopefully some of you got as far through the blue book to find that. The idea is that the PEDS is done at the 6, 12 and 18 months. It's done at two, four, th two, three and four years by your early childhood nurses. So this is our universal surveillance in New South Wales. I reckon 10% of the population are using these. I didn't get all of mine done either um, with my kids. So, but they, they are there. And this is, this is the first stage of, of child, for all children who should be routinely being surveyed around their development. Um, but particularly our population with new babies, this is the entry level into the system in terms of making sure that when everything seems to be going well, it really is. Um, I think if there are more significant difficulties, we go down different routes. But this is the surveillance. So it looks at, it asks, are you worried about the way your child's talking? Are you ask, worried about the way your child understands language or following instructions, their fine motor, gross motor skills, their behavior, their social emotional, so you know, how they get on with peers, how they get self-regulation, tantrums, self-help, which is, you know, depending how old you are, feeding yourself, toilet training, getting dressed, etc., And then preschools or school readiness towards the end. And I thought I edited that one out, never mind. That's the ages and stages. It's a lovely 1960s photo, I think, on the front. It's a well-established UK tool. Uh, I think it has been reviewed since the photo. Um, but that photo is still on the front. Um, this is a whole series of questionnaires, and you get a different questionnaire depending on how old your child is. So if, if the PEDS raises a concern, you are worried about X, Y, and Z, the early child nurse is supposed to give you this questionnaire, which you then use um, or depending on the age. So from four to six, four months to 60 months, and then you fill that in. And this is normed, so we know what the typical population does and whether or not you fall within that range. Uh, and you score, the, the, the nurse will score the PEDS the ASQ and then send you on as necessary. Um, there are some difficulties here for some of our populations in terms of the fact they're all written in English and we need to work around that but, but um, it's a, a better system than not using at all. Ultimately if there is a difficulty then identified in the ages and stages the early childhood nurse is supposed to refer you to whoever it is in your area. In my area it's me or us, um, in other areas it's often the paediatrician. To, to look at the difficulties, find, make sure there are no medical concerns, and then move you forward to a definitive assessment as required. In New South Wales, it's mainly through the DNA services, so diagnostic and assessment services, um, most of which are located in the metropolitan area. So it does mean quite a lot of traveling for families or the private services locally. Um, that's usually a monthly disciplinary model if you're working in the public sector um, and it provides that comprehensive review of development of behaviour looking for diagnoses, developmental diagnoses. So moving on to sort of targeted screening, so the TS population, which is then this is a lifelong screening, but the same applies that we've talked about in terms of early childhood and, and universal surveillance. <coughs> so it's about looking for difficulties early so that then you can step in and make a difference sooner rather than later, and things are easier to treat sooner rather than later. Um, the reason why screening is important in this area of TSC is because we know that there are an array of behavioural, developmental, learning and neuropsychiatric challenges or manifestations associated with TSC. So learning problems, intellectual disability, autism, spectrum disorder, attention deficit, hyperactivity, 
um, anxiety, depression particularly as you get into adolescence and older children, and memory and executive function in those that have more normal cognitive function. Um, there's a huge variability between individuals and, and that's probably the bigger reason why you need to look and you need to ask specifically because it's so broad and so so different and you know I do my TS clinics on a Tuesday, um, my TS Tuesdays, and um, they I, I have such a variety in children and, and you, it is important to step back and say, you know, maybe compared to the last child I saw, you seem great, but what are your issues? Uh, and you need to look at them specifically. And if there are none, that's great, but you need to look. Um, so um, why is it important? Well, patients and caregivers often report that the cognitive and the behavioural difficulties are the greatest challenge in TSC. Uh, I think that depends what age you're at and what the epilepsy is doing, but that, that does seem to be a consensus over the lifetime. Um, we know that they're under-recognised, under-diagnosed and under-treated. So this is back from like 20 years ago nearly, um, the 1998 um, conference, but things haven't improved massively. Um, so there was quite an evolution in terms of looking at language and looking at screening systems. So in the 2003 there was a consensus, an international consensus came together looking at the neuropsychiatric side of things, behaviour, cognitive difficulties, and they published two big recommendations in 2005, which was that you needed to perform regular assessments through the lifespan of cognitive and behavioural difficulties for children and adolescents to establish a baseline at diagnosis and then look as time went by and that if difficulties or, or changes occurred that in behaviour and cognition you needed to look back for physical causes as well as not just calling this behaviour. Um, back when everyone got together again in 2012 there was a big gap continued. So I think Petrus de Vries had done a study and they were finding like about 18% of individuals with TSC were getting this screening that had been recommended since 2005. Um, so the vast majority was not. And they felt that there was a huge confusion because we, you know, developmental pediatricians use one set of language, you know, psychologists, neuropsychologists, educational psychologists, psychiatrists, we all use different language to d describing similar or slightly different things. And they felt that if they came up with one term that encompassed things, it would provide some clarity. And that's where the tuberous sclerosis complex associated neuropsychiatric disorders, or TAND, um, came from. So it's a, it's a term that just encompasses that range of difficulties. And they recommended that there was an annual review for those TAND difficulties for all individuals with TSC. Um, so that really, that's just like a diagram. So it's really encompassing both the neurocognitive, learning, development, behavioural, psychosocial, so family functioning, individual functioning and mental health, all under one banner headline. So this, um, I think I've said that, it, it covers that sort of the whole range of the neurobiological, the psycho, psych, psychological and social aspects. Um, it relates not to behaviour, mental health, neurodevelopmental difficulties, intellectual development, academic development, neuropsychological and neuro psychosocial manifestations. And everybody with TS would be unique. So their own profile, which may well change over time, but that's but different from the patient who you see before and di different from the patient you see afterwards. Um, so they, they recommended, so just skipping back slightly to that 2012 consensus document, the one that um, is outside and also talked about by David this morning, it said that all patients should receive that comprehensive assessment at diagnosis to determine the um, developmental level, behavioural difficulties, etc. And then again, as required, to uh, allow early intervention as well as annual TAN screening. And then these more comprehensive evaluations at key points. I think that's probably the most difficult thing to deliver. Um, in terms of available resources as the systems currently stand. This is the suggestion, oh, sorry, fiddling, um, in terms of when those assessments should be done and what should be done. The, it, this is, I don't know that this is being delivered anywhere in Australia. It's certainly not being delivered where I work. Um, the biggest impediment in terms of getting you into my service is that we are nominally a disability service. So if you don't present with a disability and everything looks fine, trying to get you in to do a formal assessment that's going to take all morning, the service just does not have the capacity to do that. Um, and we need to look, keep looking at what are we missing, how, what other ways can we do it, um, because 
once there's a difficulty, we can get you into the service, but it's that routine surveillance aspect of it that's much more difficult to, to provide in terms of these, not the universal surveillance, because that should be accessible to everybody, but these comprehensive assessments, um, which are time consuming. Um, and sorry, that, and that's all the way going up into adoles ad adolescents, school age, adults. And again, that means working with the Department of Education, school counsellors, because they're the people that potentially have the resources to do this. But again, if they don't perceive that there's a problem to get them to do it because it's mandated, suggested, it's best practice is actually really, really difficult. And that's one of those things where then we need to try and work out how we can provide those services outside of a research setting, which is essentially where I think it's been working best internationally. The TAN, the TAN checklist was then developed following the 2012 guidelines to, to provide this unifying tool that could be used at different ages, different needs um, across the lifespan. Um, it's divided up into various sections. I think you've all got a copy of it. Um, so it t initially it starts off with introductory items so that you can sort of get a feel for that individual if you've not met them before. So in terms of where they're at with the developmental milestones and current functioning. And then it sort of takes this dimensional approach where it looks at behavioral issues, psychiatric issues, which are essentially diagnosis, intellectual level, academic level, neuropsychological level, um, which I think you're gonna get a lot more later, so I'm not gonna go there, uh, and psychosocial level in terms of functioning, family functioning, personal relationships. And it gives the opportunity to provide uh, a discussion about whether there's any other issues that we haven't covered on, and really provides this sort of structured interview, which then should lead to providing, so what are the top three problems? What are our goals? How are we gonna go forward with those? Um, so this is the TAN checklist, so that little bit at the top is, is um, that very first section in terms of looking at developmental milestones. Um, this then goes through the other steps, so current level of functioning, looking specifically at behaviours that we see in the various disorders that are associated with TS, then looking has this individual patient, um, adolescent, got a, um, a diagnosis already? Have they had IQ testing? Where are they at in terms of that? Um, and then looking at learning issues. So where are we at with reading, writing, maths? Um, moving down into the, this neuropsych, um, so attention, um, executive function, and managing yourself, managing activities in, in life, uh, thinking, switching between activities, etc. So the really subtler end of things, really. Um, but no less impactful um, if, those are what, is that, if that's what you're struggling with. Uh, and then looking at how things are going in terms of how you feel about yourself, how things are at home, um, and then the impact things are having currently. And then that plan, what's the plan? Which I always like, I like a plan at the end of everything. Um, and whether or not there's any other things we haven't talked about. So essentially, obviously my Mac doesn't quite match up with this as it did at home. The intervention and the management should be individualized. So the, the, the ultimate guideline from the 2012, and that has not changed, is that there are, at this point in time, although I think this will change, there are no TSE specific management for the TAN disorders. So if you have autism, you need to be managed as per the best evidence for autism, not autism in the context of TS. But I think that we're looking at that. There's a lot of research happening around that, and that may well change. But currently, those are the guidelines. Um, and they need to be individually planned, obviously. Um, and I'll move that, there we go. So if you want more information about it, there, there's, it's on the website here, They've, they're in your packs. It's worth filling it in, taking it along if your doctor's not using them. There is a really nice interview with Petrus de Vee on the American website where he does a tanned interview with a mum um, and just sort of works through it. And I think that's, I thought it was quite useful in terms of looking at, at doing it and your health professional may find it useful. Um, and in terms of normal developmental milestones, and the best website around is still the, the um, federal government raising children. And if you're looking for ideas in terms of stimulation and play, I always flog this. It's, um, it's, again, it's on the Sydney Children's Hospital website. It's a lovely resource, not to five, lots of developmentally useful information in terms of stimulating activities and play. Mm -hmm.